The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Welcome to this episode, the first of its kind that we are piloting on the Australian Investors Podcast. In this episode, we're going to introduce you to a new segment we've been wanting to do for quite a while called Core Satellite Avoid. That again is Core Satellite Avoid. This is where we take five ETFs, managed funds, stocks, licks, REITs, whatever you can think of. We take the five things and we run them through a bit of an investment filter and we tell you whether we think they could be appropriate for a core portfolio, a satellite allocation, or plainly, it should be avoided. We won't hold back in these sessions, but what we need you to do, if you do like it, is to let us know via the link in the show notes that says, ask a question. If you select the Australian Investors Podcast, you can just leave us feedback. You don't have to use it as a question and answer function. And you can request which funds or ETFs you want us to take a look at. It's that simple. In this first episode, we've got the GlobalX Battery and Lithium ETF. This is the ACDC ETF, what a ticker symbol that is. We've got the Van Eck Global Clean Energy ETF, or CLNE, the BetaShares Global Sustainability Leaders ETF, or ETHI, ETHI, as most people know it, the iShares Future Tech Innovators ETF, or ITEC for short, I-T-E-K, and finally, the Vanguard Ethically Conscious International Shares ETF, VESG. These five ETFs all have something in common, and we're calling it the Future Focused ETFs. So we'll be looking at each of these ETFs in order and talking to you a little bit about how they're constructed, what goes into them, etc. Now, of course, we're talking about finance and investing. So what we discuss here on the show is limited to general financial information. When we say something might be good for the core or the satellite, you could plainly disagree. And I'm sure many other financial professionals would disagree too. So it's really important that you read the product disclosure statement of all of these funds slash ETFs that we're about to talk about. And of course, never act on the information until you've spoken to your financial advisor. Without further ado, let me know if you like the segment. I'm joined by Mel Vincent, our newest team member here at Rask Australia. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast, a very special one because we're welcoming Mel Vincent to the airways. Mel, how are you going? I'm really good, thank you. Although a bit cold, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Probably a bit colder than you because I'm in Melbourne, you're in Sydney. <laughs> True. Mel, for those of you that don't know, I haven't met her yet, you probably will if you come to one of our 10 events that we're putting on throughout the remainder of 2023. Mel is our head of events and marketing manager at RASC. She joined us from GlobalX, which is a sponsor of the program. We will be talking about one of those ETFs today. But Mel, before I hand it over to you and get you to maybe take us through this episode, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So like you said, I am the marketing manager and head of events at RASC. I've been here for what, maybe two and a half months now. It's gone really, really quick. But before that, I worked at GlobalX in marketing product marketing. So knowing a lot about all the ETFs that are on the market and you know how they can help investors. And before that, I used to work at a actively managed fund, but 
had a little bit of an interesting background. I actually used to be an actor many, many years ago. I lived in the UK doing that. And when I moved back to Australia, I just studied finance as my postgraduate and decided I wanted to get into the world of finance just because I was interested in investing. So that's kind of what brought me here. Cool. Yeah, it's interesting. And that uh, the active fund that you worked for too was extremely niche. Totally. It was in med tech. So super, super niche, but really interesting. Mm, for sure. Okay. So we're gonna ha- I'm going to hand over the reins to you for this episode because we're going to do a bit of an ETF flavor. So given that you have the ETF background and um, you're well-versed in all these matters, I thought, why don't I let you host this one and I'll play your guest. Yes. Okay. So Dad, the tables really are turning today. I'm going to be grilling you, Owen, on five ETFs. So we're going to kind of do a core satellite of a void of five different ETFs. Now, there is so many ETFs that have come to market now. I think there's over, well, well over 250 now with over 40 ETFs added to the exchange just last year alone. And with more choice, it's great for investors, right? Because they can choose investments and ETFs that suit their personal values and interests. And one of the areas which has really kind of skyrocketed in the last few years is that whole ESG future focus investing. So that's kind of what we're going to dive into today. I was actually at the ASX investor study the other day and the discussion around ESG investing was really um, interesting. It was it found that over 31% of investors are interested in ESG investing. There's still There was still a discussion around there not being kind of a definitive definition or framework and parameters around what exactly is ESG. But the way I've kind of thought about it today is with that future-focused lens. So investing in companies, industries, sectors that are going to be at the forefront of innovation in the future, whether that be through you know clean energy, batteries, EVs, and so forth. Cool. I, I like this because, um, I mean, this is a really interesting area, particularly now with not just the climate change and sustainability, I guess, discussion, but also artificial intelligence technology everyone's looking to the future thinking what if and this is not a new thing but yeah it's cool amazing yeah well so we've got five etfs today in no particular order other than alphabetical not in order of our favorites we have the first one is the global x lithium and battery etf ticker is acdc we then have the bannock global clean energy etf the ticker is clne Followed by the Beta Shares Global Sustainability Leaders ETF, ticker ETHI, which actually is the ninth most popular ETF in all of Australia last year. So not just in terms of this kind of investment. And then the fourth one is the iShares Future Technology Innovators ETF, ticker is ITEC. And then finally, the Vanguard Ethically Conscious International Shares ETF, ticker is VESG. So. Hope you've got all those. Hope you've committed them to your memory. <laughs> yeah, so we've got ACDC, CLNE, FE, ITEC, I-T-E-K, and VESG. Good mix. Yeah. I thought we'd touch on all the kind of, well, not all, but some of the providers that are really popular in Australia. So thought we'd start with ACDC. First of all, fabulous ticker. But... ACDC aims to provide exposure to the global companies developing electrochemical storage technology and mining companies producing battery-grade lithium. It tracks the performance of the sole active battery value chain index. So what I mean by value chain is it's not just miners, it's not just producers, you're getting companies, you're getting exposure to companies all the way from miners to producers. So everything from Western Australian miner to Tesla. Mm, Yeah, which makes it quite unique, right? Because a lot of funds, a lot of sector-based funds will be like mining related and will have a heavy concentration to mining or technology that rarely have both mixed together, but you really do get that. Obviously, this is your old haunt, Global X. ACDC is one of the most popular Global X ETFs. And I think 
there's a few reasons for that. It does combine the local and global exposure. So you do get your Pilbara minerals in there if you're interested in lithium. But then you get your Tesla, a little bit of that. That's about 5% of the fund at the time of recording. And I think that's what, for some investors, allow them to bridge the gap between like familiarity and new and exciting overseas. Like I said, the tick is pretty awesome. I think the other thing, obviously, that's really helped is the stellar performance of lithium and all of the things that surround renewable, sustainable energy. I'll quickly explain, Mel, and feel free to push back on these, but I'll quickly explain what I immediately look at when I look at any of these ETFs, which are not vanilla. So just like your index funds or your sector-based funds, like when there's something thematic or future focused, it's fees. Obviously, fees are indicative of the type of product. Typically, we see with thematic or sector-based funds, so thematic ETFs in particular, they tend to be in that 0.5 to 1% range. That's per annum in fees. Sector-based fees, which are just kind of like just healthcare. There's no like sugar on it. It's just sweet enough as it is. They're typically anywhere from like 0.3 or 0.25 up to say 0.6. They're kind of just in that ballpark range. I'm just going to give it a very ballpark range. And then obviously we've got the core diversified, low cost equity and bond ETFs. And they're anywhere from 0.3, like 0.03 up to 30 basis points or 0.3%. So 0.03 up to 0.3. Depending on the complexity and what you're looking for, it tends to get more expensive. So when I see the ACDC ETF with a fee of 0.69, I probably wouldn't need to look past those two things, a sexy ticker symbol and a higher fee to know that that's the camp that I will be bucketing it in. The next thing that I always look for is the funds under management. So this, some people who are very new to ETFs don't understand what this actually means, but it just means how much money is already invested in the strategy or in the ETF. When you see it published in Australia, it's what's inside the ETF itself. But underneath that, there can be a different, there's a strategy right underneath that, which could have many more funds or things connected to it. So you would know this, Mel, but you could have the ETF, which feeds in from brokerage accounts, but then you might have a different way for financial advisors to invest in that for their clients or big institutions. So one single strategy can have multiple different entry points. It can have a managed fund, it can have an ETF, it can have whatever. And so that's what we call strategy fund. But what I'm particularly looking for is the ETF fund because the ETF fund just basically tells you like in the sector, there's a reason like gravity, it's like pulling things towards it. So why is that? Maybe it's other financial advisors, uh, other investment advisors have recommended it. Therefore, we should probably take a closer look. And um, at $630 million invested in ACDC, it's fair to say like this is quite popular, very popular in fact. The next thing that I look for is the number of holdings, just really simple for equity or share-based ETFs. The reason I want the number of holdings, not just like all the other fancy pie charts, is I just want to know actually how many individual components there are inside. Because typically with some thematic ETFs, they're quite narrow in focus. So you might have, in this case, you've got 33, but you might have anywhere from say 25 up to 60, which is quite narrow for an ETF. Um, whereas in a core ETF, you could have like one to 2,000 and that wouldn't be unusual. But the thing that happens, there's, there's a double-edged sword here, Mel. So if you have one that's too narrow or very narrow, that actually can be really good if you have it as a small allocation in your portfolio and you want it for a very specific thing. But that means it might be a satellite or a tactical exposure and a, not in the core. But let's say, for example, if it had a really wide net and it owned a couple of hundred shares. Well, then all of a sudden, maybe that same ETF could be considered a core position because it's pretty well diversified. So those are the things that I look at. Then obviously track record and working backwards. I love five-year track records. I love three-year track records. One year, not so much. In fact, not at all, to be honest, unless I'm just comparing it to see how it's fared in recent economic conditions. But now all of that, I don't want to do that once. I may as well do it with ACDC and then we can use that as a jumping off point for future ETFs. But um, the ACDC ETF, as you know, has performed incredibly well. It's compounded at 28% for three years. So that in itself is going to increase the farm. It's going to increase attention. And that's because you've got the lithium play. You've got the Teslas of the world, Renaults in there, these types of businesses that are direct beneficiary of electric vehicles. And I know I've ranted, but basically what this means is we've got a pretty high fee, really popular. So it's not you know going to go out of business anytime soon. It's not that diversified. It's quite concentrated, even though it does, as you say, provide focus on all of the value chain. 
So for some investors, I think that most commonly this would be in satellite allocation for most investors because you'll probably get more volatility. It's quite narrow in focus. It's slightly higher fee. Some investors could justify it as a long-term core holding as a very small position. But the problem that you have, Mal, is when people build portfolios, the core portfolios, is they typically like to know if it's global or if it's Australian. So that means that an ETF like this would share because it's partly Australian, partly global. So in a financial advisor looking at their client's portfolio, they'd be like, well, I've got 20% in global shares, for example, and 40% in Australian or whatever it is. This one would sit between the two. So it's a little bit harder for them to make it fit in the box. Not to say it shouldn't, but that's one of the things. So that's kind of my rant. I'm interested what because you worked on the inside of this ETF. What were people saying to you? All of these types of things. I did get really positive feedback. I'm not being too biased. I'm mainly just because EVs are such a big and growing part of everyday life. I mean, government policies all over the world are supporting EVs. And so this fund directly benefits from that government support. If for whatever reason governments stop supporting clean energy, then this would obviously be severely affected. But I suppose this was kind of a play if you want a direct exposure to this tailwind, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you look in the US, like case in point, in Australia and the Victorian market, I know this for various reasons, but uh, the Victorian market, the Victorian government's cutting back on its subsidies of electric vehicles. When you think about that, it's a direct kind of negative for Tesla owners in Victoria. But if you look at, they've still got the national incentives in Australia for electric vehicles. But if you look at um, America, America recently increased subsidies for electric vehicles. And obviously, Tesla being the biggest of that, uh, pure electric, you can now get $7,500 off your Tesla in the United States, which would bring the cost of a Tesla, I think, in the $20,000 range. So this ETF is effectively benefiting from government, massive government stimulus all around the world, not just in America to support the transition. So by having those Teslas and the Renaults and all those types of businesses that can actually benefit BYD, you get that, which is pretty cool. Yeah. More increasingly seen BYD on the streets of Sydney recently. I'd never seen one. I knew it was a holding of ACDC. I'd never seen one. And then all of a sudden, I've started seeing them pop up here here and there. I don't know anyone that owns one. Neither. Yeah, (laughs) if you own one, write into us and let us know (laughs) what you think. So that's ACDC. And you, you said at the start, Core satellite avoid. <laughs> yeah, core satellite avoid. Instead of buy, hold, sell, core satellite avoid, which is the question that people ask, right? Like avoid it, don't bother. Satellite, obviously, it's a smaller position. It's probably three to five years, not five to 10 plus years in the core. I would say for me, satellite for ACDC, I think it sits firmly in there. A lot of people interested in this exposure would definitely see that this is like a top two or three position. There may be a, a case to be made for active ETFs or active funds in here, not just active ETFs to be in here. But I think over the distance of passive exposure to these types of businesses will be appropriate. Yeah, nice. I agree. We will move on to the next one then. So it is the Vanek Global Clean Energy ETF, ticker CLNE. And that fund invests in 30 of the largest and most liquid companies involved in the clean energy production and associated technology and equipment globally. It is a highly concentrated portfolio, just 30 stocks, that is purely looking at energy producers. And the fund tracks S&P Global Clean Energy Select Index. So it is, as it says on the box, super concentrated. It just focuses on clean energy and the technology that supports clean energy. So things like semiconductors. I would say this is like a lot more niche than the first one, but it does capture, however, a whole bunch of different energy types. So I suppose that's a different way to diversify in many ways. Yeah, well, you've got like solar panels and arrays and different types of batteries for infrastructure and that type of stuff. I remember doing a review of this when it launched actually, the Vanek Clean and GTF. So 0.65% again is the fee just below ACDC, 117 million invested in it, which is probably indicative of both the niche factor, which you mentioned, but also that it's quite new, only launched in March 2021, I think. About the same holdings, 36. This means it doesn't have a full track record yet. 
Most financial advisors and most institutions and most asset allocators typically need three years. And there's a reason for that. Not only does it weed out some of the trash, to be honest, but it also, for their licensing, they actually require a three-year track record or an external research provider to give it the tick. And this hasn't reached that point yet. Some ETFs can get the tick long before the three-year mark, which is fine. But this one, uh, you can see that that's probably still in that, that gap. And this could also explain like a lot of those research reports that give the tick on ETFs or managed funds. Mel, you, you know this. It's driven by the advisors in effect because if a fund's doing well enough, the advisors go to the researchers and they say, hey, how can we have any research this? Hey, I want this in my portfolio. Why haven't you researched this? And so then they, it's kind of like a push and pull thing. But the ETF is down in total return terms at 4.8% annualized. So about 10% over the past six months. And so not many new advisors will be running to an ETF or a fund that's underperformed recently or since inception and saying, hey, give me a rating because I really want to invest in this for my clients. But generally, like you get a diversified mix across different assets. I think very niche, which means that it has to go in a section of your portfolio, which is not designed to be in your core. Like it's a small holding, maybe in low single percent holdings. And it's a play it by ear kind of thing. Like, see how it goes. Yeah. And I suppose it kind of the performance of this would kind of depend on what energy type was in favor. It would definitely benefit off of certain types of stimulus or trends, but then other ones might get forgotten. We'll just look at lithium over the past three years, maybe not so much the past 12 months, but previous to that, lithium companies were by far the best performing companies on the Australian market. And then maybe in Another year, something else makes a comeback. Maybe it's copper. Maybe it's whatever. Uh, we had coal for a while, right? And that meant that a lot of these sustainable ETFs, not so much the global ones which we're talking about here, but the Australian ones, they were looking for like ethical or sustainable focused exposures. They underperformed just simply because coal did so well, which is not necessarily an illustration of them being poor the operations or the ETFs not being up to standard. It's just literally because everything else did so well and it's designed to avoid that thing that did well. But a lot of end investors, Mel, as you know, don't know that. Like they don't know when an ETF should perform and when it shouldn't perform. And that's what ends up leading to people just chasing performance at the wrong time. Yeah, totally. And so I suppose for someone who was looking at this ETF, it would really be more about you wanting to get that specific exposure based off whatever you think things are going to happen in the future or whatever internal decision making you have based on your values rather than this is the hottest trend that is going to max out my portfolio and give me the most returns in the entire world over the short term. Yeah. If you look at some of the companies, it's well said, Mel, if you look at some of the companies, there's like a lot of solar panel infrastructures type businesses in there. When it comes to anything that's infrastructure or related, I think every investor should question whether an ETF is the right way to get that exposure. So perhaps there are reasons that you might have in your portfolio to maybe look at this through the lens of like a private equity fund or a listed investment company that invests in private assets, because they may give you a better exposure to the raw assets that stand to benefit or specific projects that you want. And there are ways to do that via the ASX as well. There are listed investment companies that provide exposure to infrastructure. There are some managed funds to do it, like Magellan's really good at doing this with their infrastructure fund. So there are other ways perhaps to get the exposure to these assets that you want rather than through an ETF. Yeah, interesting. It's something definitely that I'm going to have a look into, have a read about um, and for people to consider. So what would you say? Definitely not a core. Satellite avoid? I would say it's satellite just, but it would, you'd have to have strong conviction. Like I don't own it. I don't have an intention to own it right now, but it's something that you could have a small stake in now as you see that thesis play out of it. Totally. Totally. Nice. So the third one, like I said before, this is actually the sixth, or in 2022, this was the sixth biggest ETF or the most amount of flows into this ETF. And that is the Beta Shares Global Sustainability Leaders ETF. What a mouthful. Yeah, they're all a bit of a mouthful. Aren't they? <laughs> I can't get all my words out. But Ethi holds a portfolio of large global stocks identified as climate leaders 
which have also passed screens to exclude companies with direct or significant exposure to fossil fuels or engage in activities deemed inconsistent with the responsible investment considerations. It aims to track the performance of the NASDAQ Future Global Sustainability Index. So this one is a bigger ETF, so it's got over 200 holdings. So as you were kind of mentioning before, this is kind of when we start to go into slightly more core territory and it has quite a diverse exposure to various sectors and geographies. Being NASDAQ, it is heavily exposed to the US, but it does have some exposure to Asia and it has exposure to like a lot of companies that we know. There's like big large cap companies or even mega cap companies like NVIDIA and Visa, Apple, and a lot of companies with a lot smaller holdings that we would all know about. Mm. So when I look at a sustainability leaders type ETF, so the sustainable business, what I think of is quality, Mel. Like I think of a business that is high quality, so therefore it's sustainable. In this instance, we've kind of inferred as an industry that sustainable means like something green. Like um, it means... I don't know, like, you know, solar panels or not, you know, avoiding tobacco and things, the industries that are PC for lack of a better term. But the thing is, before we had these, we had sustainable ETFs. And one of them that we had was the Qual ETF. The Qual ETF is the biggest, I think, factor ETF in the country. It's got about 3.7 billion invested in it. And this ETF has 300 or so shares versus the the sustainability leaders from BetaShare, which has about 212. And the reason I bring this up is because I think that these are almost a comparison. These are very comparable if you remove the focus on the the ethics side of things. Because one of the factors that goes into the quality ETF is a sustainable profit, like a sustainable business model underlying it. And so just to throw some numbers out, over five years, the beta shares ETF has won out here. It's 16.3% versus the 14.9% from the quality ETF. If we drop down and we see the standard deviation, I've got the numbers in front of me. This is a standard deviation is a measure of risk and they're basically the same. And so basically over the last five years, beta shares is one of performance. They're very similar in terms of the risk factors that you might look at. And so I wouldn't be just comparing the sustainability leaders against like its ESG peers. I'd also be comparing it against things like Qual or other ETFs. Say, for example, the ESG factor is a must-have. Well, then obviously you're not going to you're not going to think about qual, but you might think about the other thing we're going to talk about in a minute, which is the the Vanguard one, which is VESG. One thing to note about the Beta Shares Sustainability Leaders ETF is is that it has a reasonably high turnover rate. So it's about thirty percent. So what that means is that about thirty percent of the holdings inside the ETF are bought or so, slash sold every year. So in effect. Because the way ETFs are constructed, you ultimately will pay more tax the higher your turnover rate. And to put it in perspective, the turnover rate for the the Qual ETF from Vanek is 24.7%, so about five percentage points less. And what that means is, this is is actually important because it might not seem like much, 30% versus 25, but the math is as follows. It means that basically the average holding period, like if you flip that 30% on its head, the average holding period for the beta shares one is three years. The average holding period for the Van Eck one is four years. So all of a sudden, you're starting to get a better tax position. Just an FYI, for the Vanguard one we're going to talk about in a few minutes, it's about 0.67% turnover. So it's a much better turnover rate. But ultimately, I think the FE ETF is really good. And I think it's clear to see why it's one of the best. It's just that if you are going at it because you want sustainable companies. There are other options. If you want the ethical overlay, I think it's probably probably the best in the country, to be honest. I mean, I can definitely see this as a position in a lot of people, like my peers, portfolio, people who are kind of starting their investment journey and they want to have that ethical slant towards their portfolio. I think this would be like a perfect place to start. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I just say that like the performance of it over five years at about 16.3%, that's pretty good. That's pretty yeah. meaty, to be honest. Yeah. I don't know if that's something that you should rely on if you're making assumptions about the future, particularly in a high interest rate environment. But so far, it's pretty hard to question the ETF. Yeah. So it's a core position for me. Nice. All right. So moving on to the one that you just mentioned, it is the Van... Oh, I lie. So we've got another one. Oh, we've got one that snuck in. Oh, yeah. Here we are. We don't need to spend long on this one. Yeah. So we've got the iShares Future Tech Innovators ETF. 
which the ticker is ITEK, I-T-E-K. And this ETF is a little bit different from the other ones. It is like a fund of funds. So it invests in multiple different iShares ETFs. And the aim of this ETF is to provide exposure to disruptive technology, driving innovation and providing solution to global challenges such as automation and robotics, electric vehicles, digitalization, healthcare innovation, smart city infrastructure and clean energy. Now, this one, like I said, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit maybe confusing to some people. So first of all, I think the first layer is it is a fund of funds. So maybe you want to explain what that is. Yeah, sure. So this is an ETF that invests in other funds, or we would call it fund of funds before ETFs were a thing. Like it was just one fund that takes the money and puts it in others. But it does this in a very regimented way. It can call itself an ETF in Australia because it it has like set rules. If it was like mixing and matching which individual funds inside of it it wants, we would say that that is not an ETF. It's an actively managed product. So it wouldn't be able to carry the ETF label. But because it's kind of set, it gets the iTech ETF uh, like moniker. That's the first level. There are some differences in that. If you have an ETF which just goes and invests in other funds, it can be okay. Like the IVV ETF, Australia's second second biggest, I think, ETF, that just takes Australian people's money from the ASX and invests it in the US equivalent of the same thing. And the reason it does that is it helps for tax reasons. Uh, you don't have to fill out the W8 Ben form if you're familiar with that one. But um, this one does it, but with multiple other ETFs uh, or funds uh, that are domiciled in Ireland, by the way. But um, just to give you a sense of what's inside it, you've got the iShares Electric Vehicles, uh, ETF, you've got the automation and robotics, smart city infrastructure. I think it's a digital something ETF, uh, the health innovators ETF, and the global clean energy ETF. I was a bit put off by the name. I've got to mention I mean, Mel. I don't know if you were, but like the name itself, the future tech innovators ETF. I would probably be more comfortable if it said current tech innovators ETF or something like that. Like I feel like we don't, none of us know exactly what the future holds. <laughs> so, and I think if you are trying to predict the future, you get into active management territory where you should back an active manager who is skilled at these things. I think a lot of people will be put off by this ETF just because it's not really identifiable what it does straight away. Yeah. And I think it is confusing um, for some people because when you look at the holdings, it will, first of all, it tells you that the holdings of the different ETFs and that might be slightly confusing. And then you can go in and have a look at all the underlying holdings. And I think it's over 900 individual holdings, but yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. I, let, let's just say, I'll just put this straight on the avoid list, not because of the reasons we just mentioned. It's actually just because it's new. It's got a reasonably high fee of 0.55%. It's got basically nothing invested in it, 2.6 million. And it doesn't, it doesn't have a track record. So unless you have super high conviction in the underlying products, I just struggle because I think, I don't know, I haven't spoken to the team at iShares, I don't know if you have, but um, I'd imagine this ETF was designed so that people who want to invest in tech in a diversified way could put that in their core. Yeah, that makes sense. Or someone's requested it. Yeah, potentially. So. Yeah, exactly. Good point. Someone's requested it, like a client or an investor that wants them to design it. And they're like, oh yeah, we'll create it. So maybe this is the one where it's probably just the best to wait and see. And if you're really interested in one of the underlying funds, you probably could just use yeah, use one of your, your international brokerage accounts and go and find them. Although, so just for, to clear another thing up that people may not understand about the ETF world is that this is a perfect illustration of what we introduced at the top of the show, which is that even though this ETF is here in Australia, the strategy is based overseas. So it just takes your money and puts it overseas. And it says that it's in Ireland, but I'm guessing there's exactly the same strategy in the US and they're probably the same one in Europe. And they all feed into the same underlying strategy. Like there's like entry points all around the world. So you might, if you have a global brokerage account, might be able to access one of those global entry points that are cheaper than the Australian one. I haven't done my research to check that, but maybe there is. But it's kind of an avoid for me. And avoid sounds harsh. It's more just like not right now. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. That makes sense. But interesting concept. So finally, last but not least, we have the Vanguard Ethically Conscious International Shares ETF which is VESG. And this ETF provides a low cost access to a broadly diversified range of securities listed on exchanges in the world's major developed economies. So it is a buy and hold, this is what they say, 
for investors seeking long-term capital growth through exposure to an internationally diverse portfolio, which excludes securities with significant business activities involving fossil fuels, nuclear power, alcohol, tobacco, gambling, weapons, adult entertainment, and conducts related screen based on severe controversies. It's always interesting when it says significant because what different ETF providers define as significant is different for every single person. So that's what's interesting. And they have exposure to, I think we said over 1,500 companies in this one. Yeah, so over 1,500. So by far the most diverse. It's even more diverse than the one that many people will be familiar with, which is VGS, which is the Global Shares, Miski International Shares ETF. The most, It's the second most popular by flows, the VGS ETF typically, but or at least number of trades or something. But yeah, the VGS ETF, which is super popular for people that have VAS, the VAS ETF alongside it, compared, I think you can just put this ETF right beside the VGS ETF and go, what are the differences? Because what you effectively get is you effectively get the impact of the ethics. So they both got pretty similar holdings around, say, let's say call it 1500. They're both big ETFs, both established, and they both have similar fees. In fact, they're identical. So then you can go, okay, right beside each other, what are the key differences? Top 10 holdings, exactly the same with VGS, except for the 10th holding, which is in VSG, I think you've got JP Morgan, I think, and in the other one, you've got Berkshire. Yeah. So in VESG, you've got JP Morgan. And in the other one, you've got Berkshire, which is Warren Buffett's company. So everything else exactly the same. Interestingly, even though they've got 1,500 holdings for VESG, it's got a quarter of its portfolio is just in the top 10. So just to be real quick, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, NVIDIA, then the two alphabets, exactly the same company, but You've got the A and C class. Uh, you've got Meta or Facebook, Tesla, United Health Group, and JP Morgan. That's the top 10. It's, and like I said, it's basically identical in exactly the same order for the VGS, except you've got Berkshire for JP Morgan. And then there's obviously a gigantic tail. I have a question about these ETFs that have such a large amount of holdings. I mean, I suppose the theory behind ETFs is you are getting the average of the market, right? But what I find interesting is with these ETFs, some holdings, you have such a minute exposure to them. Is there any point? Because I suppose if it does underperform a small exposure, it's not really going to affect it majorly. But you know, if you have a company that has a small exposure, does really, really well and outperforms, you're also not going to feel an effect. So does it actually mean anything? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. It's a really good question. And the answer is yes and no. And the easier example, like 1,500 is a big number. It's like trying to calculate how many, I don't know, rulers it is to Mars or something like that. Like your brain goes funny. With this one, you're probably better off looking at like, say, the Vanguard VAS ETF, the biggest ETF, once again, with the beta shares A200 or insert name. And what you'll see is that they're pretty much the same. Maybe one outperforms the other. In the Australian market, it tends to be the case that the 200 slightly outperforms the 300, but um, you tend to get more volatility with the 300. So you tend to get that tail wagging the dog a bit, if you, for lack of a better phrase. So there's really no difference. It's very minute, except you get a bit more volatility. Now with something like this, what we find is a similar case with IVV, the iShares ETF that has 500 shares. It's slightly outperforms VGS because it's super diversified. But the thing is this smell, it's actually... What happens, because VGS and this one have exposure to Europe, but IVV doesn't. And you could say there's a very strong argument to be said, well, it's because America has been winning the past 30 years. But what happens if America is no longer winning? So what happens if you have a European or African, Middle Eastern or Asian countries start to perform much better by their stock markets? Well, then you're going to have a case where, sure, the IVV ETF will still do really well. But you might find that these other things that kind of last 10% or 15% start to do really well. And this is where the mechanics of an ETF provider come in. Behind the scenes, Mel, what it actually can mean, and I'm sure you're aware, is that if they already own the ETF, there's not a lot of like rigmarole around like the complexity of adding to that position, like once they've established the position. And it also means that the tax can actually be like 
more effective because there's more positions and the ETF provider has established trading patterns overseas. I'll give you an example. I don't know if they do them anymore, but some of these massive asset managers used to do crossing days. I don't know if you've ever come across them. So a crossing day is when, let's say someone wants to invest in Australia from the United States and someone from Australia wants to invest in the United States. Instead of like buying and selling based on the Australian person who wants to buy in the US and vice versa, they just cross the trades so that then there's no friction involved. So there's no like buying and selling, which incurs costs and all this sort of stuff. They just effectively swap the assets. Yeah, I was going to say, it's like a swap. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But you have the tax, of course, but it's just a really simple way for them when they're humongous like this to have exposure to all the companies can actually benefit in other ways beyond what you think. It's like in Australia, and sorry, this is the last rant I'll have, but it's like in Australia where you have the shorting. So a lot of people don't know this, but many of the big ETF providers, BlackRock and Vanguard included, I believe, could be wrong, but I believe this is true. They allow, when their ETFs are a certain size, they allow the assets underneath, like the shares inside it, to be short sold. So a fund manager might approach one of these massive providers and say, hey, you've got like $10 billion just sitting there. I want to short shares of Tesla, for example, just as an example. I'll borrow that from you and promise to return it. And Vanguard does all the checks or whoever does all the checks and says, yep, cool, no worries, but it's going to cost you 5% a year or 3% a year. Or And you see the short sellers on the TV and whatever. And what actually happens is it's not just Vanguard and it's not just BlackRock. Like This is just a generalization, but they can actually take that money that they earn from lending those shares out, knowing that they're going to come back and everything's safe. They can actually take that money and put that directly against the cost of the ETF, lowering the effective cost. So even though you might see on the label, it says 0.1% is the fee. At the end of the year, the actual fee that you pay might actually be lower but they don't publish that uh, all the time. So some people really miss that benefit, but it's common and it happens all around the world. Now, the ETF providers have a choice whether they want to do that or not. You'd have to follow up with Vanguard Australia or BlackRock or whoever you want to follow up with to check that. But that's another benefit of having a wide net is because you can potentially do things like that. Now, at the end of the day, what we just talked about, Mal, most people won't ever think about. They won't ever, ever think about that. And that's perfectly fine. Yeah. I mean, we could do a whole episode about that if you want to get super geeky. But at the end of the day, it's basically just mirroring a fund that they already have less the ESG. So they may as well just own the shares, right? So the synergy is there. So I think if we just bring it back to, was it core, satellite or avoid? I think this ETF is a good, very good, very good alternative for investors that want to build a purpose-built ESG portfolio from the ground up, just like with the ETH ETF, which we I didn't mention, and the clean ETF and this one, you got to make sure that these funds aren't greenwashing. you got to go and check what's in the portfolio. Absolutely. And the way you do that, there's two ways. One, you check the methodology. They have PDFs, like the index provider. In this case, it's Russell for Vanguard. Check what they actually uh, say they're going to do and then go through the portfolio holdings and check Okay, they said they would avoid any company with 10% in tobacco, or 10% of sales from tobacco. Okay, this one's got 9.99%. Totally. And what happens? Yeah, what happens if it falls out of that? You know, I suppose with index, with ETFs, they're not rebalancing every month like an active manager. So how long is it going to stay in their portfolio if it does fall with it without that framework and there's all those considerations? Yeah, at the end of the day, you want to check those things because... It's not so much the case with this one, but some of them charge you extra for having an ethical overlay. Like some of the ETF, the sustainability ETFs are quite expensive and the ethical ETFs and all of that. It kind of goes against the grain, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but they would say, oh, well, we've got to pay analysts or our index provider is more expensive because they have to pay analysts and do the ratings and all that sort of stuff, which I get. And that's fair enough. But at the end of the day, you shouldn't have to pay substantially more because it's not like, like they're going to make the index anyway. So just check that if you are paying more, they're doing their job. That's really, I think this is a good option. I think if I had to choose between this and the beta shares one for my core, even though the beta shares one is larger, I'd probably go the Vanguard one. I think the beta shares ethical screening is better, but it results in fewer companies, just over 200 or so. 
Whereas the Vanguard one is a little more loose, to be honest with you, but you get a lot more diversification. We say these things. I don't want anyone to go and sell either of these or any of these based on what you hear on this podcast, but you could have both, I think, Mel. I think, and if you already kind of had your core portfolio already built and you just wanted to add a little bit more of an ethical slant and the beta shares probably would be more of interest. But if you're kind of building from scratch and you have no holdings, then maybe a larger exposure would be more interesting. If you're more in the IVV camp, it's not exactly the same. But if you're like more like, I want to back big companies globally, well, you might go with the beta shares one. But if you want just like a blanket explosion of the world, you might go with the Vanguard one. I'd probably, if I was just taking someone off the street, I'd probably say that the Vanguard one might be more sensible. But if it was someone who was actually engaged with their portfolio and wanted to check all their ESG and that, well, the beta shares would probably be the better quality option, if that makes sense. But yeah, I mean, don't just act on what you hear here. Make sure it aligns with the ethical values and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So... So to recap, Mel, we uh, ACDC, good, good ETF, uh, good thematic, or if that's how you want to frame it, thematic ETF, I'd probably have it in the satellite. Clean, uh, it's very small or relatively small, not very small because there's another one on this list that's much smaller. Still emerging, still needs to kind of prove its wares. Ethi, like you said, one of the biggest, say six biggest by flows, like new money added. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. And it's easy to see why it's a really high quality filtering process. iTech. Super niche, super small, fund of funds, probably not right now. And VESG, really impressive, low turnover, so it's good from a tax perspective. And it's diversified and it's established and it's got a track record, so all good. I feel like uh, this was a bit of fun, Mel. I feel like we should do it again. I agree. I agree. I've learned a lot and hopefully other people have too. Yeah. If you do want us to keep doing more of these, if you like the idea of us putting ETFs side by side, I feel like do it. Mel and I will jump behind the mic and we'll we'll go through. And it's clear to see that you've had experience in the industry, Mel, because uh, like some of the things that you mentioned from the other side of the fence is really interesting. So yeah, right into us. Let us know if you want us to do more. Uh, you can find Mel. Mel's on all the social media channels, LinkedIn, yeah, Instagram. If you see something on Instagram or wherever from us, it's uh, probably from Mel anyway. So you can just send us a message and get in contact. But Mel, heaps of fun. Thanks for joining me for this first episode of yours on the Australian Investors Podcast. Thank you. I had a lot of fun and hopefully we will see you guys all soon at the Rask Roadshow. Yes, great point. Yes, if you are wanting to come and meet up with Mel and I and a community of investors, we've got some so many of our hosts, so many expert guests. We've got Global X sponsoring. We've got uh, Magellan coming along if you're in Sydney. We've got Waddle Partners, so Drew, that fellow, if you know him, Jamie, the whole team, the clan will be going around Australia. Thanks to Mel putting it all together. So well done to you. Thank you. I think it'll be fun. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Well, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF or ASX JEPI, J-E-P-I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion dollars as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.